Um, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to the, um, to the last session in the organ transplant seminar for the winter quarter. Um, but I do want to remind you that we have a fairly complete spring quarter coming up and that there's one addition at the beginning of the spring quarter. The, currently, the spring quarter starts on uh, Wednesday, April 17, but in fact, we're going to start a week early on, um, on Wednesday, April 10. Uh, we have a visitor from Israel, Dr. Sperling, who's going to talk about organ transplantation in Israel, um, which has been a, a, a sort of a controversial area be, because some of the buying and selling of organs um, have worked uh, through Israel. I, I don't know that, that Dr. Sperling is going to specifically address that, but I hope that that will be part of the conversation. So that's April 10, and it's not on the schedule. So we'll meet here uh, at the usual time. Today, today I am... Uh, Ross, yeah, come on, come on. Come on. <laughs> today I'm delighted to welcome Mark Russo uh, back to the University of Chicago. Uh, Mar Mark uh, prepared a paper, uh, Organ Allocation and Lung Transplant, with David Meltzer and uh, Robert Gibbons, um, and, and Mark will be delivering the paper. Uh, Mark is now a cardiovascular surgeon who specializes in complex and reoperative aortic valve surgery at the Newark Beth Israel Medical Center um, in New Jersey. Uh, Mark received his MD from Albert Einstein, a master's degree from Dartmouth, and completed his residency and fellowship at Columbia University. Um, Mark, Mark Russo is um, an experienced uh, heart and lung transplant surgeon who's participated in more than 400 uh, organ transplants. Uh, he's authored 130 published manuscripts and textbook chapters focused on improving uh, healthcare quality and clinical outcomes uh, for patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, it's a, it's a delight to welcome Mark back, and I'm looking forward to this wonderful paper. Mark, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this work. Uh, I almost didn't make it. My flight actually got canceled, and I was <laughs> able to jump on another airline. So, uh, but it's, it's, day. yeah, it wasn't because of weather. It was, uh, I, I, it sounds like it was a plane that I didn't want to be on. Um, but uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone. So uh, this is some work that I, I, I've done um, with, with David Meltzer and Robert Gibbons. Um, I'm going to go through a variety of things uh, related to the allocation of organs in uh, lung transplantation, specifically focused on the issue of medical urgency uh, and, uh, and geography and how those impact uh, uh, the allocation of organs. So uh, disclosures, I don't have any conflicts. Uh, our research has been funded by the Thoracic Surgery Foundation for Research and Education and also by a uh, startup grant from this uh, CTSA ITM uh, core subsidy. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Quan Her, uh, Liz Johnson, and Orly uh, Merlot for their help uh, in developing uh, the manuscripts related to, uh, to this work. So briefly, lung transplantation is a therapy for patients with, with end-stage lung disease. Uh, these are people with uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, IPF, sarcoidosis, pulmonary hypertension, and COPD. Um, it's, lung transplantation has been shown to improve survival and quality of life in appropriately selected patients. Um, however, there is an issue, uh, is, which is true in basically all areas of transplantation, where there's a critical scarcity of organs available for, lung, or for transplantation. Uh, that is, demand is greater than supply. Uh, there's less than 2,000 lung transplants performed in the U.S. annually, uh, and there's somewhere around 4 to 500 patients that die every year while waiting. I'm going to assert that given the critical scarcity of organs, uh, the primary objective of organ allocation should be to provide maximal uh, net benefit to society from the available organs. So how are organs allocated? First, organs are matched based on ABO blood type, uh, size, uh, height, and weight, um, whether the patient needs right, left, or bilateral transplantation, and then this issue of medical urgency and geography. So for a minute, I'm going to focus on what medical urgency means and, and, uh, and how geography impacts uh, organ matching and allocation. So first, medical urgency. Uh, before 2000, before, um, before 2000, May 2005, priority uh, for lung transplantation was based on waiting time. 
That is, the longer the patients were on the waiting list, the higher their priority. Uh, as you can imagine, that might create a selection bias. Uh, critically ill patients who are rapidly decompensating were unlikely to survive to transplant, and stable patients who are well enough to wait were the ones who actually got the organs. Uh, again, you can imagine that that could create a number of issues in terms of uh, how the, the organs are allocated. Uh, in 2005, uh, the long allocation score was implemented. So uh, this was implemented for a few reasons. First, to reduce the number of deaths on the lung transplant waiting list, to increase trans uh, transplant benefit for lung recipients, and to ensure an equitable uh, and efficient allocation of organs to active transplant candidates based on uh, medical urgency rather than on waiting time. So medical urgency as defined by the S LAS score uh, was, it was developed based on a multivariate regression model, uh, first to predict the risk of dying during the following year on the waiting list versus the likelihood of surviving during the following year after transplant. Uh, the risk of dying is weighted more heavily than, um, uh, than the likelihood of, uh, or than, than survival. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's something to keep in mind, uh, potentially for a discussion later on. So the scores can range from zero to 100. Uh, Rarely do patients have a score less than 30, but score between 30 and 50, to put this in perspective for uh, people who don't uh, see lung transplant patients, um, a score of 30 to 50, weightless survival can be measured in months to years. Uh, from 50 to 74, survival can be measured in weeks to months, and greater than 75, it's usually uh, days to weeks. So what are the factors that, uh, that impact uh, LAS? So uh, waiting list urgency parameters include age, uh, oxygen requirements, body mass index, diabetes, uh, six-minute walk test, functional status, and then some measures of pulmonary function. Uh, Post-transplant survival is based on age, uh, need for mechanical ventilation, functional status, uh, what their diagnosis is, uh, and again, some pulmonary functional status. It's worth pointing out also that the, the, the way the score was constructed, it can be changed over time based on what a regression, what the model that they used to develop the score uh, predicts, um, but this was the initial, what the initial score, uh, those were the, the important factors in the initial score. So now on to geography. Um, under the current system, all patients are prioritized by LAS, but, but before LAS score, patients, our organs are allocated first based on geography, regardless of LAS. The primary unit of organ allocation is the local, ge uh, local geographic unit known as the uh, donor service area. In uh, the U.S. and Puerto Rico, there's 58 of these. This is what the map looks like. Um, so initially, again, organs are offered to a subset of appropriately matched patients based on blood type and size within the donor's DSA, so within one of those 58 areas. Uh, therefore, it's possible that a less ill candidate uh, within the DSA could receive an organ over a more severely ill candidate outside of the, that DSA. And further, it's possible that, you know, you can imagine based on those borders, which are somewhat arbitrary in how they're drawn, that a less ill candidate may actually be located further from the donor hospital than the more severe candidate, but it's, it's determined based on, again, geography and borders. Um, so if there's no appropriate candidates available in the local uh, DSA, then the organ can be allocated to the next largest geographic unit, which is the region. There's 11 regions. This is what the regions look like. Um, so I'm going to present a real life scenario. Uh, a 27-year-old cystic fibrosis patient was hospitalized in the ICU while waiting for a transplant. His LAS score was 91. Um, that gave him one of the highest LAS scores in the country, and again, that suggests that his survival is measured in days to weeks. Um, an appropriately matched organ was available 20 miles away from where, that, where the patient was hospitalized, but it was outside of his uh, DSA area. So this is what the waiting list looked like. The, the uh, yellow line, uh, that's our 27-year-old. He's number five for priority. If you look at, uh, if you look at the LAS here, uh, this patient has a score of 91. Patients who are ranked higher in priority have scores of 40 and 42. Again, those are patients whose survival probably can be measured in months to years. Um, these are uh, patients of particular interest, actually the patient of 31. Um, the reason I highlighted two and three is because one and four, uh, the patients, uh, those were, the organ was declined for reasons that, that uh, I don't know. But um, if you expand the list further, you can see that the area in yellow, those are all patients with higher LAS scores than the two patients who are in the positions two and three. So that's just on one page. There's actually, I think it turned out that there was 27 people who had a higher LAS score in the region um, than the, the patients, uh, the local patients uh, who were ranked two and three. So what happened? Uh, so again, um, <clears throat> Just to reiterate this, currently lungs are, are offered first to the subset of patients in the, the local DSA, and it only uh, is offered out regionally if there's no acceptable candidate. Uh, and this, so in this case, uh, number two on the list was a 69-year-old, which uh, creates 
we could have an entire discussion about the ethics of transplanting 69-year-olds, but a 69-year-old local candidate with an LAS score of 40. Number three was a 71-year-old with a LAS score of 31. Number five was our 27-year-old regional candidate with an LAS in 91, located 20, 20 miles away from the donor hospital, but outside of uh, that specific DSA area. So given the critical illness of the 27-year-old uh, regional candidate, a request was made for compassionate release of the organs. That is, uh, the uh, transplanting center for that candidate went to the other center and said, would you, release, would you please not take this organ so that we can give it to our 27-year-old? Uh, that request was denied. Um, the organ went to the one of the local candidates. I don't know if it was the 69-year-old with an LAS of 40 or 71-year-old with an LAS of 31. Three days later, the 27-year-old candidate was placed on ECMO. Five days later, he died. So there raises a, there's, a, there's a couple things that clearly I'm placing value on people's lives saying that I, I don't think that I was unclear in my suggestion that the 27-year-old probably has greater benefit from the transplant um, than the 69 and 71-year-old with lower LAS scores, but um, maybe that's not true. So first, do patients with higher LAS scores receive a greater benefit uh, from lung transplantation? So this is a study that we did with looking at uh, the uh, UNOS database, which is a national database for lung transplantation, uh, the study population include all lung transplant candidates greater than 12 years old uh, between two th May 2004, which is when LAS was implemented, uh, in, in May 2005, I'm sorry, May, May 4, 2005, uh, through May 4, 2009. There were 6,000 people uh, approximately in that pool, uh, and follow-up data was available through November. Um, so we stratified the transplant candidates based on their LAS at the time of listing uh, into three categories, LAS less than 50, 50 to 74, and greater than 75. So uh, basically what we did was try to calculate the net benefit uh, of net survival benefit of transplantation by calculating what um, the actuarial survival for a patient was get based on a given LAS score if they remained on the list versus what their anticipated survival was uh, or the anticipated graft survival uh, if they were transplanted. So um, the waiting list outcomes include uh, patients who are live on the waiting list, patients who are transplanted, dead on the waiting list or lost to follow up. So the actuarial wait list survival, uh, candidates were followed from the date of listing uh, to death which was the outcome of interest, or if they were transplanted, they were censored, or lost a follow-up, they were censored. Post-transplant actuary graft survival was calculated. Uh, recipients were followed from the date of transplant to graft loss, which was the outcome of interest. Uh, if they were lost to follow-up, they were censored. It's worth noting that almost none of these patients are lost to follow-up, because if they're lost to follow-up, they're usually dead. Um, uh, so the net benefit by LAS. So if you look at the low, what, I, what we call the low priority, stratum, which is LAS less than 50, you can see that the waiting list uh, survival and post-transplant survival basically overlap. Uh, suggests, uh, the way I would interpret this is the area between these two curves is the net benefit. Basically, there's no net benefit. And if you further stratify this by, uh, by LAS uh, ranges be of, of 10 points, uh, actually, patients with LAS less than 40, the, uh, the, not, the waiting list survival is is superior to the post-transplant survival, suggesting patients actually have a negative net benefit. Uh, you can see in the intermediate term, or in the immediate priority stratum, LAS between 50 and 74, uh, there's a pretty good distance between, this is, uh, this is the post-transplant survival curve, this is the waiting list survival. Uh, there's a pretty significant benefit here. Same thing with the high priority score. So what do we conclude from that? We conclude that recipients less with LAS less than 50 receive little uh, or no net benefit, survival benefit from transplantation. Uh, and it's, as I mentioned, if you uh, further stratify those, uh, patients with LAS less than 40 may actually do worse with transplant than without. Uh, recipients, and that's actually something to keep in mind when we get into who actually gets the organs. So recipients with LAS less than 50 appear to re receive a net survival benefit from transplantation. So the next question is, who actually gets the organs? Uh, this is uh, a breakdown of uh, how the organs were allocated based on LAS. You can see that 60% uh, of the patients who are transplanted have an LAS less than 40, um, and another 23% uh, have an LAS between 40 and 50. So basically, uh, more than two-thirds of the patients who are transplanted have an LAS less than 50, um, which, you know, based on the survival curve, suggests that we may be getting marginal benefit. There's issues of quality of life, which we can talk about later. Uh, it might not be all about survival, but nevertheless, uh, th there's a, a significant minority that, uh, of patients who get transplanted with an LAS greater than 50. So looking at this differently, LAS score less than 50. Uh, most of the patients with an LAS score less than 50 are, are 
receiving lungs locally, uh, and most of the patients with LAS scores greater than 75 are receiving lungs regionally or nationally. Uh, so that means that the patient, the organs actually have to be offered out into a greater area for the higher priority patients to receive the organs. So. Another study that we did basically using the same data set, uh, we looked at the distribution of patients uh, uh, who are listed for transplant and the patients who are transplanted by LAS. And you do see, in fairness, that most of the, so this is all of the patients who are listed uh, with an LAS less than 40, these are the ones who are actually transplanted. So low priority candidates, uh, those are patients who uh, have an LAS less than 40 and between 40 and 49 comprise the vast majority of, of both candidates, so people who are listed, about 88% and recipients, uh, almost 90 percent. So um, subsequently we looked at what the natural history of, of survival on the waiting list is. So, and the reason that this is important is, okay, so most of the patients who are listed have lower scores and most of the patients who are transplanted have lower scores. And that's probably not a problem if people with higher priority scores aren't dying on the waiting list. But, but we asked the question uh, essentially is, were they dying? So again, same data set. So this is this is a curve looking at patients who are alive on the waiting list, percentage of patients alive on the waiting list over time. So uh, the alternative is either they, they were, that they died or they were transplanted. So these are patients still waiting. So uh, if you look at most of, the, most of the outcomes determined in the first 60 days, um, you see that very few of the patients with a score of uh, greater than 90 are still on the waiting list even at 60 days, and almost none, uh, I think. Uh, um, greater, so patients who have a score greater than 40, uh, Less, uh, less than 6%, uh, that's not right. Uh, that's not right. That should say greater than 90. Less than 6% are still alive uh, on the waiting list at one year. Um, but of the patients who are, so who was actually transplanted, you see that, uh, again, uh, focusing on the 60 day mark, because that's where a lot of this, the curves are the steepest. Um, you can see that uh, at one, or actually we'll focus on one year. At one year, uh, the highest number of patients transplanted was, again, patients in the lowest uh, LAS group, so 40, basically uh, less than 660, and the lowest was, was the higher priority candidate. So the, what we're really interested in, who's dying? Um, you can see that at 60 days, 40% of the patients with an LAS greater than 90 uh, were dead. Um, and that it's a stepwise uh, decrease as you go across LAS. So again, there's a fair number of patients who are dying um, with higher LAS scores while we're, low, while we're allocating organs to lower LAS patients. So based on this, uh, we asked the final question that I'll, I'll present here is, uh, is the allocation, local allocation of, of lung donors resulting in lower rates of transplantation among uh, higher priority lung transplant candidates. So that is, um, is it actually the way organ, the question that we're trying to get at, is it actually the way organs are allocated or are there some other, and is that, is, is it related to geography or are there other factors that uh, we aren't understanding here? So to determine that, and this is a very simple study um, in preparation for a uh, more sophisticated analysis of this, uh, was to determine the frequency with which uh, uh, when a patient with a blood group and size, uh, when, a, when a blood group size match candidate with a higher LAS score in the same region existed uh, when organs were allocated to a local candidate. So that is, you have a donor, they match based on uh, ABO blood type and size. Uh, was that organ allocated to somebody with a lower LAS score locally when a higher, when a more urgent patient existed regionally? So use, we use the UNOS data. We got special permission from UNOS to, uh, we actually got daily LAS scores for each candidate. Um, Just to clarify, does this mean they would have gotten the organ if they'd been local? Yes. Be yes. Um, so we got a special data feed from UNOS where they provided LAS score so for each candidate offered. every day. I'm sorry? It would have been offered. It would have been offered. It would have been offered. That's that fair. Mean that gap. Um, so this basic, so what we, we were able to find was there was, so we looked at 2009 data. We, we limited the analysis to double lung patients, and that's because it becomes too complicated to look at right versus left versus double. So there was 580 double lung uh, transplants that occurred in 2009. Um, the data that uh, UNOS provided us actually had 5, 000, or, I'm sorry, 5 million observations because, again, it's LAS for each day. So it was the day uh, and the LAS score that was basically the observation. It's not patients. Um, so. Uh, so we, try, we define an event as, again, when an appropriate ABO matched, height matched, double lung candidate existed in the same region as, as a donor, uh, but the organs were allocated to a local candidate with lower LAS. Is that more clearly stated? Because I know that I stumbled over it the first time. Um, so 
the primary outcome measure was was what we called an event, so any event. And the secondary outcome measures, basically, we looked at uh, the LAS point differential. So that is, what was the LAS score of the person, the, can the local candidate who actually received the organ versus the regional candidate who did not receive the organ. Um, and then we looked at the number of transplants that were impacted, and most importantly, the number of people who subsequently died uh, after they were bypassed for an, an organ. So. Uh, Delta LAS, again, is the differential between um, the patient, the local patient who was transplanted and the regional patient who was bypassed. So, uh, so any difference, there was, this occurred about 3,400 times. A difference of greater than 10, it occurred about 800 times. A difference of greater than 25, it occurred 250 times. And a difference of greater than 50 occurred 60 uh, three times. So that means for each transplant, so each one of those 580 <coughs> transplants, uh, there was an average of six regional patients who had a higher LAS score, so greater urgency than the patient who was actually transplanted. Um, there was about one and a half uh, with a 10 point differential. There was half, on average, half a patient uh, for a 25 point differential and um, about one in 10 transplants had, uh, had a, a differential of greater than 50 points. So how many transplants did this impact? So no point of, or any point differential, it was 480. So that, that equates to about 83% of all transplants. There was somebody who had higher urgency who was not transplanted. Um, the, uh, a differential of greater than 10 points, it was about 55% of the transplants. Uh, 20, a 25 point differential was about a third of the transplants and a uh, greater than 50 point differential was about 8% of the transplants. Uh, so going, uh, so this is what I would use the most the most important, even though it wasn't the primary measure, I think this is the really, you know, this is sort of the upshot. So how many of those patients subsequently went on to die? So any point differential, 15% of the patients uh, went on to die. If there was greater than a 10 point differential, 27% uh, of those patients went on to die. If there was, if there was without being transplanted, uh, if there was a greater than a 25 point differential, then uh, th about one third went on to die. And if there was greater than 50 uh, point differential, about half of those patients subsequently died. And wouldn't have gotten the lungs if these people got the lungs would have died too. So do you sort of take that into account or not? Um. I don't for this, and there's two simplifying assumptions here, and uh, Ed pointed out one of them that, uh, to uh, irrespective of your question, one problem is we don't know why the patients weren't matched. So um, it's possible that. Uh, it's possible that those patients would not have been transplanted anyway. So these are uh, these are sort of an overestimate. But I'll also uh, so to answer your question, um, uh, in terms of um, would someone have died subsequently? It's interesting if you look at, and I'm not going to present this data, um, but if you look at patients who most of the patients who are transplanted had scores lower than than certainly lower than 50 and even lower than 40. When I say most, I mean like 90%. And so then the question becomes, well, would those patients have progressed uh, in their disease process and then subsequently died? And the answer appears to be no, that most patients' LAS score doesn't change significantly over time. Whatever they're listed at, that tends to be what it is. And that's not to say that's true for all patients. But I have data, which I uh, don't have readily available, but um, that shows that, that um, most patients score stays within about a five point range so they stay within the stratum that they're in. Very few patients flip in and out. Um, one other thing I will point out though is this sort of, so uh, there's 185 patients who I'm basically claiming died because they were bypassed. Uh, there's, uh, you could make a counter argument that that's actually an underestimate because we're only talking about 580 double lung transplants. We're not talking about the other uh, 1,500 single lungs, and there's also a question of people who get double lungs. There's clearly some diseases where the patients need double lungs, but there's other diseases where they may not, and we could get greater benefit if we split those lungs and gave them to two different different recipients. All very complicated questions to address here. Um, so in conclusion, my conclusion is that uh, the current allocation system results in a high frequency of organs allocated to lower priority candidates, even when an appropriately matched higher priority candidate exists uh, regionally. Um, so based on the data I presented, um, I would I would summarize this by saying that most uh, donor lungs are allocated to low priority candidates, that is, uh, patients with an LAS score of less than 50. Low priority candidates appear to receive little or no uh, net survival benefit. Uh, whether they have improvement in quality of life, I can't estimate based on the data available to me. Um, but the third point is that high priority candidates continue to die at uh, reasonably high rates on the waiting list while this is occurring. So what's the current state of affairs in transplantation? Uh, if you go back, um, almost uh, 15 years, uh, the I, uh, Institute of Medicine panel concluded that broader organ sharing uh, 
or broader sharing of organs led to an overall increase in the rate at which the most severely ill uh, patients were transplanted and uh, a concomitant de decrease in excess transplantation of less severely ill patients without increasing pre-transplant uh, mortality. So this is a group that David and, uh, and Robert uh, sat on. I think that they were the first two authors on this uh, IOM paper. Um, the, their analysis focused on liver transplant, um, but the questions are the same. Uh, in liver transplant, the, the uh, allocation is slightly different than in lungs. Um, going on to 2000, uh, after this report was issued, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services issued what the, the infamous final rule, which was intended to assure that the allocation of scarce organs will be based on common medical criteria, not accidents of geography. Uh, in 2005, uh, the OPTN, Lung Allocation Subcommittee, recommended changes to the lung allocation policies to minimize the effects of geography on waitlist outcome in an effort to reduce mortality. Um, despite the above, organ, lung organ allocation remains a locally based system. Um, so opposing points of view, um, following the announcement of the final rule, there was a, a bitter uh, debate in the transplant community about uh, what should happen. Concerns were expressed that implementation of the final rule would increase the cost of transplant, so that is by distributing organs by a wider geography would require, we would incur greater costs. Uh, Force the closure of small transplant centers, um, adversely uh, affect access to transplantation for minorities and low-income patients uh, and discourage organ donation uh, and result in fewer saved lives. Um, based on the IOM report, uh, there's no evidence to support any of these things and 15 years later there's really no evidence to support any of these things. And I would also argue that transplantation is so expensive that adding a few thousand dollars for a flight to, uh, to procure an organ, if the organ goes to somebody who gets a significant survival benefit versus somebody who gets minimal benefit, it probably pays for itself, although I can't prove that right now. Uh, so what future studies are we doing? So basically what we're interested in, and this is really the uh, upshot of this and unfortunately we don't have final data to present. But um, using the same uh, analysis that was used for the IOM study, uh, which uh, was a mixed effects uh, regression model, we wanted to test our central hypothesis that organ sharing over broader geography would result in, in better organ allocation as measured by higher rates of allocation to higher priority patients and prunes survival on the waiting list among lung candidates and increased net benefit uh, of, of lung transplantation. Um, Based on this data, I'll just throw out a few questions um, which represent largely limitations of the data that I have. Um, first, all of this is based on the fact that uh, we are, you know, how do, how do we define priority and that, that the LAS actually uh, appropriately defines it, um, which I actually think it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's at least a step in the right direction. It's a pretty significant advance, uh, actually, in my opinion. But um, what would be, what should be the guiding principle in organ allocation? One of the first things I said that uh, the guiding principle should be that uh, we get net, we get maximal net benefit uh, from from a societal perspective from all the organs that are available. There's people who would argue that that is not necessary, that that shouldn't necessarily be the guiding principle. Um, is survival the most appropriate outcome measure? So one of the things that uh, I said repeatedly was that in the lower priority groups, survival uh, is not improved, uh, but it may be the quality of life is improved. So if patients are on home oxygen and transplant allows them not to be on oxygen or if they can't get out of a chair and, uh, and now they can have some quality of life, even if it doesn't improve their survival, then that, th those those quality of life measures are important. Unfortunately, there are no good quality of life measures uh, in this population, which is definitely a shortcoming for the field, and I think that's something that, uh, that should be addressed. But um, should we be transplanting patients of with LAS is less than 50? If we assume that, that survival is the most important outcome, then maybe we shouldn't. But, but again, there's probably other markers that, that need to be assessed before we draw any firm conclusions about that. And finally, do we really have a shortage of lungs relative to, to needy candidates? Um, based on the data that, you know, based on the studies that I've done, I could actually make a pretty strong argument, I think, that it's not that we have a shortage, we're just transplanting the wrong people, and that's why high priority patients are dying. Um, I won't present my solution, but I'll stop there. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm actually a supporter of regional sh um, sharing of organs, but when I listen to you talk, I'm actually struck by, it seems like the solution for this is may be um, geographic sharing of organs, but it may also be sort of um, more policing of the list because it seems, I mean, if it's true that people who once they're on the list don't really have a change in their score, then some people are being listed too late and other people are being listed probably too early. And I don't know if the geographic sharing would 
alleviate that or if, if there could be some additional list management that might yeah. help? Well, I mean, there's people who are certainly uh, more expert in this topic, and you know, if you want to weigh in at any point, then please do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's clearly access to care issues, um, and also the natural history of the disease isn't necessarily such that people are on a gradual decline where they, you know, could be picked up at any point along the way. They um, patients may have a sudden decline and then plateau, or they may just have a sudden decline and never make it to the list, or they may have that gradual decline, and that's probably also a function of uh, their disease process. Um, I'm talking about these patients like they're all the same, and one of the limitations is that COPD is not the same as IPF, which is not the same as pulmonary hypertension, and the problem that we have is that we don't have enough patients in each one of those subgroups to make generalizations about that specific subgroup, so I'm, again, bunching them all together as if they're all the same, and they are clearly not. Well, the scores come up very differently. I'm sorry. The scores um, may be comparable, but the disease states are not, as Marcus stated, and the progression of the disease state in each individual disease is very, very different. IPF patients tending to progress more rapidly, but they all start at the same level. I don't have any contention with what you've said at all. It was my contention as part of the group that actually formed the LAS that we should be doing geography, and that was uh, that was the third rail of discussion. Um, uh, and I think that the discussion today should be centered on not so much the regions as on concentric circles. Yeah, from the donor so area. if I went on that, I would actually. Yeah, um, two regions. things about that. In fairness to the group, so you know, everybody, you know, if you just hear this for the first time, you think, well, you know, this committee had the opportunity to fix this. Um, these laws are governed by states. So there are governors who have said, we are not going to allow our organs to go outside of our state boundaries uh, until our citizens have the opportunity uh, to have a shot at them, essentially. And so this is way beyond, I and mean, this, is, this is a much larger issue, and this is an uh, issue that Donna Shalala attempted to address 15 years ago and still remains a pretty uh, significant point of contention. Um, because you raise the point, I would, and again, there's people who know more about this than I do, but my understanding of organ allocation in hearts is that patients are first, uh, organs are first offered to their status 1A, 1B, and status 2. Uh, they're first offered locally, um, and then if there's no local status 1A, then it's offered to a 500 mile radius, and then if there's no 1A, then it's offered a 500 mile radius of status B, and, and so on. Um, and so, again, the idea is concentric circles rather than boundaries. You could do the same thing in lung transplant. You could stratify patients by LAS. Um, you know, I keep uh, my, um, uh, by uh, custom, I've been I've been stratifying by uh, groups of 25. Um, so you could do the same thing. LAS greater than 50, you could go locally. I'm sorry, greater than 75, you could go locally, then a 500 mile radius, and so forth. Um, again, the problem becomes that there are state laws that prevent this from happening. It can't be concentric circles because uh, people have actually actually initiated laws that would prevent that. Uh, the only thing that I would add to your concerns is the cutoff at 50 for transplant, just because for discussion's sake, 40 makes more sense because 40 includes the 80% of the highest scores, uh, or the 20% of the highest scores, rather. And um, so it's a skewed it's a skewed distribution. It's not an even um, or a Gaussian distribution from zero to 100. It's very skewed in the 30 to yeah. 40. And, and again, to, to make this point, because I don't want to walk out of here and s think that we're, tra you know, 80 percent of the people that we're transplanting aren't getting any benefit. Again, one of the problems here is that a patient with an LAS score of 40 who has pulmonary hypertension might be different than a patient with COPD who has an LAS score of 40, or a patient with IPF who has an LAS score of 40. But again, the numbers aren't large enough at this point to be able to make any conclusions based on those specific subgroups. So, um, so that piece of it, I don't want anyone to walk out of here thinking we, we, you know, we only need to do 20% of the transplants that we're doing. May not be suitable for a patient who would be at higher score. So, you know, that doesn't, you know, your analysis does not include why the organ was turned down for that particular high score patient. Because if you transplant that organ on that high risk patient, probably the patient won't benefit because the patient may not survive <laughs> because the organ is not really going to be able to support that patient. So that can be used better in a lower score patient because you will have a survival. So that is very important. One of the take home messages is there is lung donors and there are lung donors which are not equal in all terms. So you got to, you know, there may be, there may be other things which are going not real, more kind of judgmental in selecting the matching the donor for the recipient.
The second thing I think you did already talk about, what is the geographical region? Is it the proximity or is it the borders? That's the issue, I think, no? And again, I, uh, we can move forward with the question. Uh, it's going let me see if I can pull up, uh, I mean, uh, please keep asking questions, but again, to look at the geography, I mean, this is what the regions look like. So again, um, it's so, somewhat arbitrary of how the regions are, are drawn up. It's clearly not concentric. Historically, this came about over a discussion in a bar late at night. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 mo kidney, like, mo <laughs> about kidney transplantation in the um, late 1970s and early 80s before UNOS existed. But you're saying that the, even within these colors, there's not sharing. I mean, you're still no, there is. So once there the is organ there. gets, liver, if the, there is in liver, yeah. It's, it's all. So it's local that is closest to the donor hospital um, within a service area. So all of the purple part of northern Illinois here would be one donor service area. This little thing up here is considered Wisconsin. That's Rockford. Um, but that's by Wisconsin law, and, and uh, which, which is another. You know. One of the things that's interesting, you know, it's interesting that I chose this topic to explore because the center I'm at now, we're actually the second largest heart transplant program in the country. And the reason that is is because there's essentially nobody else doing heart transplant in the state of New Jersey. So if an organ comes up, we have to turn it down before anybody else gets shot at it. Um, and so I trained at Columbia, which is in Manhattan and not far from where I work right now. And they've actually transferred patients to us because the waiting time is shorter. Um, and so I frequently take the opportunity to make fun of them for that um, when we transplant the patient within a few days when their patient would have waited months. But it's, but it's not, I mean, but it's an, also an unfortunate, you know, it's unfortunate that we, it's fortunate for us we get to benefit from that, but it's an unfortunate state of affairs. It's not, it's not good policy for us. We really ought to have why, why is New York its own OPO? Um, well, New York. Well, New York, New York has separate. Has two, has two. There's New York City and everything New York else. First of all, it's really it's good to have you back. You want to stay? <laughs> Second of all, your scenario that you presented at the beginning is pretty interesting not just because figuring out who's sick and who's not sick, but that another center wouldn't say yes to having a really sick kid transplanted. You have no idea how interesting that is, and I, I don't want to say what the details of that scenario are, but um, it involves me, the center. It didn't happen, it happened somewhere else, but, but people, it's people who, who we know. So I think the- And the, who knew each other. Right, and the bad part about that is, so you can complain about the inefficiency of this system, but there was a very obvious scenario where somebody clearly would have benefited from being transplanted. Shouldn't even be an issue when you get contacted about it and they don't get transplanted. That's a, that's a bad problem. Yeah, I mean, but those are, the, those are the rules and people will exploit the rules. I mean, again, just to be clear, it's no one in this room, but, but it's, it's people we know and the people knew each other and they should have been able to come to a reasonable uh, resolution here. And it's particularly interesting because, you know, we could have a debate about whether people who are 70 years old should even be transplanted. The, the, the median survival <laughs> post-transplant for patients in their 70s is less than two and a half years. Uh, the 27-year-old cystic fibrosis patient, know, he probably has the there. best opportunity for long-term survival right. of any of our candidates. So there's a huge inequity in terms of what the potential benefit to that patient was and what the, uh, I, I don't know what the outcome of that patient, although I could probably find out uh, what the realized benefit from that specific organ was. It's, um, it's a really interesting scenario, and, but it, it happens all the time. Could you, could you go back and talk a little bit more about the two notions that you had in one of the earliest slides? You know, what does priority mean? It, it seems to me that that's related to the one that followed. What principle are we following? Yeah. So would you explain in general what that question, well, what priority so, means, and then what your own priority So would be that's what's for. confusing about this. Well, the way LAS is presented, we would say the guiding principle is LAS score, and that's how we allocate organs. But clearly, what trumps that is, is geography, which is why we keep going back to geography. So priority is determined, again, based on what you're into, and, and at, at any point, because you were on the, on the committee that did this, and so you're much more expert in this than I am. But the LAS score was developed based on a multivariate uh, regression analysis of the UNOS database uh, to determine factors that were predictive of both survival on the waiting list and the absence of transplant and survival post-transplant. 
So uh, in an attempt to determine who would get the best, the, mo the greatest net benefit, um, that's what that score represents. Now, one of the because one of the issues here is that you would think, well, the sickest patients, you might think quickly, the sickest patients are going to get the greatest benefit, but they might be so sick that they will have a poor outcome post transplant, or you know, in the absence of or with transplant. So that's one of the issues. And so, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, so one of the issues is LAS would suggest that the patients with a score of 90 have the highest benefit, but again, their survival in the absence of transplant is weighted twice what their post -transplant, expected post-transplant survival is. That might not be the right ratio, and so if you go back to my analysis where I showed you the areas between the two curves and suggested that, well, maybe it's, you know, who is getting the greatest net benefit? By my analysis, it's actually patients with a LAS score of about 60 or 70 who get the greatest net benefit because the patients with 80 and 90 are so far are so severely ill that many of them just die immediately after transplant, so they never achieve that benefit. Um, whereas the patients on the lower end of the spectrum, many of them would live for years in the absence of transplant. So are you saying then that the priority means the number of survival years? It's a predicted number of so percentage of survival of the coming year is how it's scored. So it's coming year? Just coming year, year. One year. year. That's how it's calculated. Uh, it, we looked at it at one, two, and three years of survival, mm -hmm. and they were approximately the same, but more controllable at one year. So that's why we chose the number. It was statistically um, a stronger uh, sure. measure. And I take it from the talk that you would have some qualms about that because the quality of life during that time. <coughs> yeah, is well, not the problem considered. is that, I mean, each one of these steps. So first of all, we're talking about one year survival. Clearly, when you do a lung transplant, it's a $250,000 operation. We're hoping to get more than one year of survival out of the patients. Um, there's, there's a number of limitations. Is, is it absolute survival, or is it quality? Is there a quality of life or some other measure? There, there's so many. It, it's very difficult. And the other problem, with one of the problems with lung transplant is, you know, and again, there's people who are more expert on me who can comment on this. I would say that the, that the current era of lung transplant didn't occur until until the early 2000s. So we don't have a lot of long-term follow-up. We don't have huge numbers of patients to look at. Liver transplant, kidneys, they have huge numbers of patients that they can look at. It's difficult in this area because there's a smaller number of, of organs that are available. If you're asking me what my opinion is, the guiding principle should be that the organs should be allocated um, based on the greatest net benefit to society. Do I know how to make that happen? I don't. I mean, I, I think it would be having long-term survival, having having good data, looking at longer term survival, say five year, three or five year survival, and determining it based on, uh, again, the net benefit of transplant versus not transplant. But again, it's, that's much easier f to say than it is to, to really hash out. Thank, thank you for such an intriguing and, um, you know, uh, talk. But, you know, one of the, so the other side of the equation, you kind of just discussed this briefly, is the whole outcome after transplant. And, you know, we know that patients that have the higher LAS scores actually do poorly after transplant. And as a lung transplant, in the lung transplant community, we kind of wonder what is the best gauge of when we should say no to a, a patient who is too sick. And so your, you know, your study argues, you know, a score between 50 to 70, okay. but is that, you know, the question is, is that, you know, that, that would be another, another potential issue to, to address. Well, and again, when you think about the complexities of that, because now we're assuming that LAS, me so we took a multivariate regression that's supposed to predict net benefit, and then we're going and determining and trying to assess what the actual net benefit is within that. So the LAS has no, I mean, it has no innate meaning. It's a, it's a number. So we're sort of taking the net benefit of the net benefit in a sense, which makes no sense. I mean, I, I, it, it, no sense. But um, uh, I think the real issue is, again, trying to come up with a regression model. First, so what are the, so what's the outcome measure? What's the balance between survival in the absence of transplant and post-transplant survival? Uh, and then what, um, and then determining what the net benefit from that is. So there's, there's issues with how the score is calculated, making sure that you have the appropriate data to even do that, uh, which I'm not sure that we do because, again, we have to focus on one year because that's where we have enough patients to really be able to look at one year survival. If we looked at three year survival, then, you know, from 
for we would basically eliminate you know three or four years of data so that would give us six or seven thousand fewer patients in our sample it's it's a complex issue there I don't think there's any and that's why I say I think the LAS is a great step board it's clearly not perfect to the credit of the people that developed it they it, it's sort of a living uh, equation and that it can be it should be reassessed over time and and further improved and that may mean that the balance between post transplant and waiting list survival uh, is adjusted the factors uh, in the model are, are are changed over time as we as we get uh, more predictive models. Um, the model, you know, for anyone who's a, st a statistician here, uh, the, um, uh, the area under the curve for a, a model in, in predicting lung transplant survival at one year uh, is probably about 0.65. And that's whether, you, you know, you can, you can just use regression analysis or you could use more complex uh, computational systems and it still uh, comes out to about 0.65, which is not a great model, quite honestly. So, I'm sorry, let me say one other thing. And the other thing that we have to assume is that patients who, um, who aren't transplanted, that's them being censored is a, is not, does not bias us. I mean, patients may not be transplanted, may be delisted, and presumably those patients die, although I, I don't know that for sure. Um, but we count them as censored rather than as a death on the waiting list, and that certainly could skew um, our, waiting, our estimates of waiting list survival. So... I, I, I realize you were trying to avoid this in some ways, <laughs> but, but in, in your scenario, you, you, you pose this, this, the fascinating issue of this compassionate release, right? Which, from the description, it, 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 it was intended to, to be that safety valve in some ways, right, on the scenarios that you are pointing to that are limiting um, transplants to occur, right? The, and it, and mm -hmm. it should work. So. It, it seems to me there are two other factors in this. It's not just geography, right? You, you pointed to politics, mm -hmm. state politics, which I think is a very real issue. And secondarily, it seems like there's a cultural issue in terms of relationships between transplant yeah. centers that's important. So my question with regard to that is, are there scenarios where the compassionate release actually works? Oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, I can tell you scenarios where patients had, you know, without going into the details, positive cross matches, multiple positive cross matches, which means that they, there's very few organs that they could accept. One comes up, it was destined for somebody else, and a call goes, and people would release that organ. This is not representative. This should not be viewed. This is a, an absolutely extreme example that I happen to know know of because I know the people involved. So then the question becomes, well, who should police this? In some level, it was the experts policing themselves, and even they couldn't come to a reasonable resolution as far as I'm concerned. I mean, these are people who are experienced transplant surgeons who know, you know, who know what the progression here is. Uh, there should have been no doubt what was going to what, but I think, what was a likely, what was a likely scenario you're here? You're pointing to another research direction that you know complements in some ways what you're in, you know attempting to do here, which is to look at how it is that those transplant centers where compassionate release works judge values. It's on a, and, it's on a and, one by one basis. So you're you're at the whim of the you know there's there's one transplant team that has the upper hand and you're at their whim. But, but I, I imagine that those providers, when they're in communication, in, in centers that work well with one another, right, that they have certain values and beliefs that they cling to as being important, in addition to the medical criteria that you're outlining, right, and that centers where that relationship doesn't exist, so that maybe there's a secondary avenue to be pursued here, which, which would complement what you're attempting to do with with geography and mathematics. Yeah, I mean, well, you could have a safety net where if there's clear inequity, but then someone has to decide on what that safety net is, which is probably just as complicated as, as solving the issue from the beginning. Um, you know, and again, these are people that knew each other. They knew, you know, they were fully educated in what the likely progression was. Um, you know, there is expert at this. You know, I, I don't know who else you bump it up to because these people had a relationship. They were 20 miles apart. They knew each other well. Um, and you know these are the sorts of things that happen. I mean, if you want to talk about the ethics of transplantation and medical care in general, people have perverse incentives, um, and they're not. They're, I mean, although I, maybe I shouldn't say this while I'm being recorded, not all physicians have the their patient is not necessarily their number one priority. People get paid to do operations. They have certain incentives to achieve volume measures. Uh, they think that you know. I'm sure that the. I don't know this, but I'm sure that the conversation went well. That guy has such a high score that something's going to come along for him, and he'll be fine. Well, he wasn't. Um, and then the issues become, well, uh, the organ should be located, which should be allocated locally, and there's some benefit to that. But again, one, there's arbitrary lines drawn there, and, um, and as far as uh, how things are, are allocated, people would argue, 
that you know there's a system in place and that's how the system works and they were just following the rules. Um, all things that I don't necessarily agree with, and I don't think that you do either. But but somebody somebody thought that was appropriate. Well, I think that's another important thing is even people with low scores die on the waiting list. I think we shouldn't forget that. Yeah. Although very, uh, although relatively uh, infrequently. <laughs> Patients with LAS scores of less than 40, less than 10 percent die in a year. But they do die. They do die. So, I mean, it's important to realize that so if somebody from came in, it's hard for you to stay. And essentially what you're arguing is that you have to be the advocate for your patient. You, you are your patient's advocate, and that's what this person may claim that they were, that they were doing. Yes, sir. I just want to follow up on your last point that probably most of the speakers have talked a little bit about the perverse incentives, although none as, as uh, directly as you have. And I think for, for those of us who aren't working in transplant, I'm wondering to the degree that you feel comfortable if you can talk a little bit more about what you think the prime drivers are. You mentioned, for example, like small transplant centers, their survival, or um, states having a, uh, an interest. Uh, what do you think really are the prime drivers? And as well as under the current system, which regions benefit and which regions are the ones that well, are losing? Well, my institution benefits in a huge way, like I said, because we're, I mean, there's another transplant center, but we do eight transplants to every one that they do. Um, uh, I mean, money is a huge incentive. Um, you know. A, a, a transplant pays about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the institution, and that's sort of on average. So in metropolitan areas, it could be more than that. Um, that's a lot of money. And if you put you want to put that in perspective, a cabbage probably pays about thirty thousand dollars. So you have to do you have to do five, six, seven cabbages for every every transplant you do. Money is a huge. Uh, I didn't say this, but someone recently said to me that I think this is an overstatement, but it's their view that transplant is essentially a license to print money. Um, the patients keep coming back. They need biopsies. They need immunosuppression management. Um, it, relative to all other things, it um, it is uh, you know it makes a lot of money and it's a valued program. It's very prestigious. Centers want to say that that's why there's a whole bunch of centers out there that do four and five transplants a year because um, you know there's institutions want to say that they do transplant and they have no intention of, of growing that volume, but they just want to say that they do transplant or transcatheter valves or, you know, whatever the high, you know, robotic surgery, whatever sort of the high-end marketable things are. Uh, no one ever asks, well, how many, you, you know, most people don't ask how many do you do. They just know that they do it, and that's, that's good enough. So, um, yeah, so there's volume issues. You have to do a certain number to be, uh, to be CMS certified. Uh, it, I think it's, what is it, 12 or 15 that you probably need to? 10. Um, so. I can tell you that this is a center that wasn't necessarily meeting their numbers every year, and they needed to do that. I mean, that one transplant difference could be it could be the difference between their transplant program surviving and not surviving. Um, and yeah, so outcomes. I mean, it's a low LAS patient, even though they have advanced age. You would expect them to do reasonably well in the short term. There's a number of, of competing incentives, and and they shouldn't be over. I mean, they can't be overlooked. It can't be factored in in the context of this, but. But uh, particularly in transplant, um, uh, prestige and, and money have a lot of, I think, impact on the decisions that people make. That all being said, I do think that the overall driving force is actually for patient care. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and <laughs> no, no, but, I, but let, there, let me there, say now that I, I think I think that I think that you know transplant. Physicians are among, are maybe the most committed of all. I mean, you know, it's really, it's, it, there's a life, I mean, it be, it's, it, it's a life commitment. It's not just sort of a job that you show up for. Um, so I don't want to say that, but, but there are these other issues. When we were setting up the LAS, there was a lot of discussion about how we would destroy the collegiality of physicians and surgeons in lung transplantation, and we have in some ways. Um, by uh, allowing borders to get in the way. When there was a waiting time, everybody understood it, even if it was unfair, uh, except to patients with COPD. Um, but everybody understood it. There were no questions about it. There was collegiality. There was sharing for um, compassionate reasons. But when you start putting borders and rules and lines on it, then um, um, the mustering of forces to over overcome those rules is much more difficult. It just given that that what you described, it strikes me this may be one of those cases where when you put the rules in place, people's psychology changes to, well, am I keeping the rules rather than, um, you know, am I doing the right thing? And, you know, I think about uh, Chris Castle's essay, uh, Knights, Knaves, or Pawns. Uh, 
talking about the, the, the way that the system approaches physicians changes their psychology about what they do. So if the system says, well, physician, physicians are going to be perverse, so we've got to put some rules around them to control them, well, then they start thinking in terms of just keeping the rules. Um, and we see that with billing. You know, the, when in 98 or whenever it was when Pennsylvania was uh, fined $40 million for up billing, they put all these rules in place, and now everybody up bills uh, because the rules allow it to. I was going to ask one of the questions that you kind of posed on your last slide. If it looks like, at least from a mortality standpoint, there's no benefits to transplanting an LAS below 40, has there been any medical research or discussion about whether there should be a cutoff at the lower end of when we should even offer a transplant? Uh, I, I don't know if there. I think so we should get into the um, like fishing laws of the slot <laughs> 40 to 80. Nothing above 80, nothing below 80. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> different issue. <laughs> different issue. Um, there's there's I, a substantial I, difference in survival uh, with scores above 80 than there are below 80 um, uh, in the immediate going. Yet so they get, they get benefit. By so that's post transplant survival. So, right. so their patients' post transplant survival is directly proportional to their LAS. That is, the uh, or I guess I should say indirectly proportional. So the lower the LAS, the better their survival, which, you know, if we transplanted, you know, if you or I were transplanted, we, we, we should do well. Would we get any benefit from that? Probably not. We, I'm sure we wouldn't, in fact. But, um, but the fact is, if you transplant a healthy person, they're going to do better. So again, that's why it goes back to the issue of, of net benefit. And that's really always the question. The problem in these situations is we know a lot more about what happens after we do something than if we choose not to do something. And so it's always difficult to, do, to, to assess what the true net benefit of anything is, because patients who get something are generally followed. They're, it's easy to define their endpoint. Patients who don't, they sort of go away, and, and there's a number of confounding factors that may impact what happens to them after the fact. I guess it just seems interesting that, uh, to me, it looks like a low-hanging fruit example where you have this misallocation of a scarce resource for no net benefits. And you also, as you alluded to, have a perverse incentive for people to transplant, and 60 or to 80 percent of transplants are going to people who potentially don't need it from a mortality standpoint. And yet no one's addressed that problem they're talking about. Well, again, it's, it's multifactorial. So it's not that there's someone sitting above all this that has, you know, has the magical power to change this. There's, it's, it's influenced by many things. And also, again, just to be clear, our, my, my endpoint of survival may not be the most important one. For COPD patients, they probably, I think we all know that they don't really get a great survival benefit, but their quality of life should be better. How do we measure their quality of life? That's a very difficult question to, to answer. Um, so again, I don't want anyone to walk away saying that we're transplanting the wrong people, but I will agree with you that I think it's pretty clear that our system is imperfect. It could be fixed with some minor changes, um, but I have to tell you I'm not optimistic that it will be changed anytime soon. Um, as an aside, uh, I got a call yesterday from uh, somebody who is on uh, the chairman of the, so STS is the main thoracic uh, surgeon society. I got a call from the person who chairs the media and public relations subcommittee, um, which I'm actually on, to apologize because my paper, because one of these papers is actually, is being, uh, is in print this month. And it was up for sort of a press release and, and, and for them to promote. And they chose not to because they thought it was too negative. And they agreed that it was obvious that there's a problem in the allocation system and they don't want people walking around thinking that the, that the lung allocation system is, is perverse, which I totally understand and agree with. I thought it was actually very nice of him to, to call me and apologize and unnecessary. But, but it is interesting. When I give this talk to a group of lung transplant surgeons, people get up and there's the number of people who agree with the number of people who disagree is usually about 10 to 1. But I still don't think it's going to change. Thank you, Mark. So much.